Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Today, uh, we want to unpack what's happening in Iran and how women are leading the way. A brief introduction on my side. On 13th of September, a 22-year-old Iranian student, it could be any of you, her name was Masa Amini and she was detained by the Iranian morality police. She was detained for not being dressed in accordance with government standards. Three days later, Massa died in detention. This sparked a whole movement, a wave of protest across Iran, started by women, but also followed by men across the country women and men that are risking their lives in protest for what happened. This protest is across the country, not just in the big cities or in the big urban centers. This protest is across social classes, not just a protest of middle classes. This protest is across generations, not just even if it includes uh, a lot of young people. This protest is also a large movement of solidarity abroad, not just by the diasporas uh, that Iran has across the world, but also by these diasporas. This is not just about clothes or hijabs. This is about freedoms and rights. The slogan of this protest is woman, life, freedom. This is the first time that women are at the origin, but also leading a civil resistance movement, a movement that I think we need to pay tribute to. This is a movement led by Iranians asking for liberties and freedoms for Iranians in Iran. But obviously, this resonates beyond Iran, it resonates across the world, and it matters to all of us because in reality it speaks of the universality of human rights. This is where the discussion is for all of us. Rights that cannot be diminished, rights that cannot be adapted, reduced, depending on religion, depending on race, depending on geography, or depending on political regime because what we're talking about is human rights, the rights that belong to all humans. And obviously women's rights are human rights, and therefore it belongs to the category of rights for all humans. So what we want to discuss today is what makes this movement different, what makes it different from uh, 2009, 2017, 2019, are we in front of a new 1979? We want to discuss how we can help Iranian women and men <coughs> uphold their rights. We want to discuss how should the world react to this form of human oppression. Now, in order to do this, we, have, we are extremely grateful to have Masi Ali Najad uh, with us joining Zoom. Thank you very much, Masi, for being uh, with us today. Masi is an Iranian journalist and activist, founder of My Stealthy Freedom. Together with Masi, we have uh, two uh, professors, Professor Elizabeth Marteau. Thank you very much for being with us uh, today. She's a lecturer at PSIA, a political scientist, expert on gender, peace, and security-related issues. Thank you, Elizabeth. And also joining us by Zoom uh, is Maria Stefan, co-lead and chief organizer of the Horizons Project and co-author with uh, Erika Chenoweth of Why Civil Resistance Works. And to moderate this session, uh, Tina Robiol, academic advisor and lecturer at PSIA. Without further ado, Tina, the floor to you to moderate the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dean Gonzalez. Um, it's, um, and thank you for providing some context for this important discussion. It is a privilege for me to moderate this 60-minute uh, event uh, with such a panel, uh, and, uh, and I would like to thank our guests uh, joining for, from abroad, but also here with uh, Dr. Marteau, um, and also to welcome you, uh, students, who are able to, to be with us in this room today, and all of you who are able to join us uh, remotely through YouTube. The focus of our, our discussion today could not be more timely, uh, considering the fact that we just marked the, you know, the, it's been one month that those protests have uh, been going on, and there's no end in sight yet. Um, and I will have the chance to first ask a few questions from our guests uh, before we launch the Q&A uh, session. So, because we we have not a lot of time, uh, let me move directly now to um, to the first question I would like to ask. And I'm going to turn to you, Masi, John. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to welcome you for the first time at, at Sciences Po. And uh, as Dean Gonzalez underlined, something about this uh, civil resistance movement is, um, is really um, unprecedented and, and feels different. And while it's not the first time since 1979 and then the revolution then uh, that we see uh, mass movements of protest and then uh, disobedience, um, this time we see a, a focus, uh, a scope, a length, uh, a level of participation, just not in Iran, but also abroad, uh, that's unprecedented. And so uh, what my first question for you is, we feel that this seems like a historical movement, moment for the Iranian people, and, uh, and we'd, it would be very helpful if you could provide some background for us to start from. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm very pleased being among you. I wish I could make it to come to France because um, I have huge admiration. I have to announce that. Eight years ago, when I launched my campaign against compulsory hijab, many people in the West, they were downplaying our cause. They were saying that it's not a big deal. Middle East has got so many bigger problems, but let's admit that here. The public opinion in France, human rights activists, women's rights activists, young generation in France, they were supportive. They were with us, translating the words that I was just collecting from Iranian women, publishing their videos, they practicing their civil disobedience, walking unveiled, which is a punishable crime. I remember that every single video were being translated into French. And that is why eight years ago, when I launched the campaign, I found the allies among French people. So thank you so much. Um, I have to say that these days are tragic days for my country, Iran. We have witnessed the death of Mahsa Amini, 20 year old girl, just because of a little bit of her hair was shown, she got killed, but that created a huge anger among society across Iran. People took to the streets to protest the brutality of morality police. But believe me, since that, it has been a month, but you never hear a single slogan against compulsory job. You never hear a single slogan against uh, morality police or hijab police. People are fed up and actually they want to end the gender apartheid regime. For years and years that I have been in touch with uh, Iranian women, I kept saying that compulsory hijab is not just a small piece of cloth. It is one of the main pillar of a religious dictatorship. And that is why now people are in the street and I call it a revolution because this is for millions of Iranian, this is the beginning of the end, the end of the Islamic Republic. This is a revolutionary episode. So for that, many people get killed. Many people get disappeared. Teenagers, schoolgirls. Sarina was only 17 year old. She was a very, very powerful teenager, hopeful teenager, full of life. She was a YouTuber. She's a TikTok generation, like Nika Shakarami, 16 year old. Both of them took to the streets, protested against the government burned their headscarves. 
Both of them got killed. What we hear from Iranian state television, bringing their family on TV and make them to do forced confession, saying that our daughters committed suicide. This is what they have been doing for years and years. Torturing, jailing, killing, false confession is in the DNA of the Islamic Republic. But in the West, we sometimes hear from some of the Iran lobbies, apologists, some of the academics saying that this is a fight to abolish morality police. That is why I'm very pleased to be among you uh, and tell you that Iranian people want to send a message to the rest of the world that this is the fight against a gender apartheid regime. And not only from the beginning, as you mentioned, Professor, that it's a, a fight for Iranians. This is, a, this is a protest for Iranians. I want to say that this is for women around the world. This is a story that everyone can relate to it. We are fighting to protect not only Iran, the Western countries from the danger of Islamic ideology, from the danger of Islamic terror. I was born in a very tiny village in Iran. My family was conservative and I was the one I had to wear hijab even inside my house. But forget that from the age of seven, if you don't wear hijab, you won't be able to go to school. If you don't wear hijab, you will get kicked out from everywhere. You won't exist. But many people say that, okay, this is about Iran and let them deal within the society. This is an internal matter. This is another wrong argument. Human rights and women's rights, the global issue. We have to stick together. Years ago, when Burkini ban happened in France, around the world, all the feminists got united. When Muslim ban happened in America, all people got united. They took to the streets everywhere. I myself got invited to go to European Parliament and condemn Burkini back. But it was heartbreaking for me to see that at the same time, when I was campaigning against compulsory job, no one invited me and Iranian women to say that. When you condemn Burkini ban and Muslim ban, then what is different? Forcing women in Iran, in Afghanistan to cover themselves. People were saying this is a culture and a culture of Iran. And they were saying that, shh, we should not talk this issue. Now, the brutal death of Mahsa Amini, Nika Shakarami, Sarina, Ghazale, that created a sense of unity among Iranians themselves and Iranians with uh, their sisters across the globe, which we are very pleased. So that unity is beautiful. But what is missing here is action especially action from politicians. So I would love to actually use the opportunity and call on female politicians. For years and years, they have been visiting our country, female politicians from your country, including Segolan Royal, female politicians from EU, European Parliament, all the Western countries, they obeyed compulsory hijab laws in front of our politicians. So this is the right time now that this unity should actually go to different stage, which is actions. And I call on them to show their solidarity with their sisters and isolate the Islamic Republic. Last point, for years and years, activists from Russia have been warning the rest of the world about the danger of Putin. Now war is in Ukraine. And now you understand why it was important to pay attention to the grassroots uh, civil disobedience activists to Russian activists who were actually warning about the danger of morality police. Now me and millions of other women inside Iran, we are warning the rest of the world about the danger of Islamic ideology, about the danger of Islamic Republic. If we don't get united to end this regime, trust me, they will get united and end democracy everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. John. And I think that the comment they just made about the unity of the movement is also what makes it very different uh, this time and, and probably more powerful. Yes. Uh, and I would like to, to turn now to um, Elizabeth, uh, based on what you were just mentioning about, you know, this, uh, this question of women's rights and, and, and you know, reactions in, in Western countries and, you know, in terms of feminist movements. Um, 
Dr. Merteux here is teaching a few courses at PSIA uh, on, uh, on gender and human rights in, uh, in particular. And, and so, Elizabeth, we know that feminist movements in non-Western countries are often criticized uh, of being the puppets uh, of uh, Western countries, raising this larger debate of universalism of human rights and hence women's rights. So could you please tell us more and how you think such movements can escape this endless mm -hmm. debate? Very complicated question, actually. I don't know how to answer, but first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for your time and for your words. I mean, in this very difficult p period and, and bloody context, and I, I must admit that we we feel powerless and helpless uh, in Europe and even in France. And as you said, uh, Tina, the, the challenge for feminism and for feminist movements today is to support solidarity initiatives to defend human rights and therefore women's rights, because we all know here and we agree that women's rights are human rights. So we must defend them globally without imposing hegemonic norms or values of principles that could be perceived as Western-centric, but in the same time that could harm people and the ground. So this is not a new debate, and it's an historical dilemma and complexity that underpins the, the defense of human rights when solidarity movements can be instrumentalized or accused by authoritarian regimes of promoting a shadow agenda, uh, the agenda of a regime change supported by, by the West. So, and it's also in a way a criticism coming from some feminists who walk a tightrope on that issue caught between uh, universalism and cultural relativism. So there's a real problem of political instrumentalization and especially in France today. So, and this is sadly what is happening in, in Europe with the support that should be expressed to Iranian women and that probably remain too shy, too limited, uh, I must admit, so there is, first of all, a question to ourselves. I mean, how shall we get out of this dilemma, out of this trap? Because we have to, so that's our responsibility. And a, a question to you, Masih, and do you see a risk? Maybe it's not valid, I mean, this assessment. Do you see any risk of instrumentalization by the Iranian regime? I mean, and does it change something uh, for the movement? I mean. Do they risk more repression, political instrumentalization, and decredibilization if we support them or not? Because maybe it's, it's totally invalid, this assessment. And th so it leads me to, to, to the second question. What are you expecting from us, and more broadly from the international community? That's a very good question. And I'm very pleased that you, you raised this question here, because uh, for years and years, this wrong narrative actually led many powerful feminists who used to be my heroes to keep silent when it comes to women's rights and uh, human rights in Iran and Afghanistan. Let me just give you one example. During the Green Movement 2009, um, people were chanting, Obama, you're either with us or with the government. So clearly, people within the society calling the United States of America to support them. But we had some academics, we had some uh, so-called activists. They were uh, like going to CNN, different media around the world, in France, fully um, like uh, they have perfect English, perfect French, so they could speak uh, fluently, but uh, echoing the narrative of the Islamic Republic on CNN, uh, Channel 4, uh, France 24, media around the world, and saying that don't support Green Movement because they called it meddling. They called it interfering to internal problem in Iran. They said that do not support Iranians because the Iranian regime will use this to oppress more people. Here we are. After years and years, President Obama said that regret. It was a big mistake. Hillary Clinton said regret. It was a big mistake. You know what? Lives has gone. More than 100 people got killed in 2009 uh, movement in Iran. Still, I am welcoming them that they admitted their error. But 
this is the time that the whole world, the democratic countries might take a lesson that human rights and women's rights, it's a global issue. And all of you know that <clears throat> Iran has a horrible human rights record. European leaders know this. They know that the Islamic Republic enforced gender apartheid regime, yet they look away. Macron knows this very, very well. He was wrong about Putin. He was wrong about ignoring Russian activists because he, he, he thought that, you know, the war is not going to come to, to Europe. They're not going to attack Ukrainians. He was wrong. Now, Macron is wrong about Khamenei as well. But you can't look away like the feminists, uh, academics, politicians. They cannot look away and ignore Iranians by saying that, uh, this is their culture, or this is the law of the land, or we don't want to interfere. By doing that, actually, you are interfering. By you, I mean those who claim that, that if we support Iranians, we're going to interfere internal matter. By keeping silent, you interfere. But more important than this, when eight years ago I launched a campaign, I called the, uh, the Western feminists that we are now fighting against compulsory a job so and then i invited you to join us many western feminists use the same argument cultural relativism um we don't want to like white savior complex you know all these terms they use this and saying that we don't want to talk about this what happened they did they went to iran they obeyed the same law that we were risking our lives and challenging the same law. So clearly they were supporting one side. Another example, right now I asked the tech companies that you have to kick Khamenei, you have to kick Taliban out of social media because people of Iran and Afghanistan, they don't have the same right to use social media. Again, they say the same thing. No, this is a fight, let's Iranian people bring their regime within the society, we don't wanna interfere. But believe me, by allowing murderers, butchers, killers, who are killing now teenagers, you are taking side. You are empowering our murderers to kill more people. So this is, I think it's clear. It's very obvious. I mean, it's the, the logic is clear. I myself, miles away from Iran, I'm not safe. They brought my sister on TV to disown me publicly, to denounce me publicly. They interrogated my 70 year old mother. They brought, they, they put my brother in jail for two years. So they sent someone to kidnap me from New York. Month ago, the FBI arrested a man with a loaded gun in front of my house who was trying to kill me. So you see, miles away, the Islamic Republic tried to uh, assassinate, kidnap, and keep us silent. So that's why I'm saying that this is a common battle. We are all fighting for feminism, dignity, democracy. So what is Iranian people are doing right now? It's the same. They are trying to protect democracy from autocracy, from dictatorship. So if anyone telling you that Shh, you're causing Islamophobia or you're interfering or in the name of uh, you know cultural relativism or this kind of argument, just be loud and proud. Be as brave and powerful as Iranian women inside the country calling the Western countries and saying that this is a historical movement. Let's stick together. Let's keep sisterhood. Let's hug each other and support each other. Do not buy the wrong narrative of the Islamic Republic and its lobbies outside Iran. This is our fight, our common fight. And we cannot win this battle until the day we get together. Together, we are stronger than the dictators. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, the, um, the aspects that you just raised uh, would, of course, I'm sure, lead to another question that uh, maybe students will raise about uh, the other aspects that governments, uh, we, we could ask governments to do, especially if we read your open letter to President Biden from last week. But before we, we go much further into this, I, I would like to, uh, to ask a question to Dr. Stefan who is also with us, and, uh, and thank you so much, Maria, for, for joining us. Um, as uh, Dean Gonzalez uh, explained, you are the co-author of a, of a really 
important book uh, that was uh, that got out uh, two, tw 10 years ago already. So why civil resistance works. Um, and Maria, you had a whole chapter in this book about the 1979 revolution. Uh, and, uh, and from what I understand, Erika uh, is now working also on the impact of women's participation uh, and, and the, the outcome of their participation on the success of mass movements. So in addition uh, to this, I, would, I was wondering, you know, if you could please share with us some of the key findings that you have that you think could be particularly relevant for this uh, current uprising, because we're wondering, you know, what is going to happen uh, in terms of the, the potential outcomes of this movement? Thank you. Or, well, thank you very much, uh, Tina. And first, I just wanted to thank you and uh, Dean Gonzalez and Sciences Po for, for hosting today's event. And really, um, I want to also express my strong support and solidarity for the women, the children, and ordinary Iranians who are taking tremendous risks um, to challenge the worst forms of tyranny. And you know, my heart uh, really goes out to them. I'm speaking to you all from New York City. Um, my heart goes out to them and to all the human rights activists around the world in Ukraine and Belarus and Sudan and Palestine, Hong Kong, Nicar Nicaragua, Venezuela, in my country, the United States, who are challenging various forms of violence and authoritarianism in their countries. And I would note Dean Gonzalez spoke about the universality of human rights. And I think now, and as we talk about international support, now at this time of authoritarian resurgence around the world is a time to double down on global democratic solidarity. So I'm glad, I'm so glad that we're having this conversation today. Um, and Tina, you asked about um, some of the research and writing that I've done on when and why civil resistance works. Um, so as you mentioned, Erica Chenoweth and I um, studied uh, over 300 campaigns of major, major campaigns of nonviolent civil resistance over the past century. And these were campaigns challenging dictatorial regimes and challenging foreign military occupations. Um, and we asked a fundamental question, what are, you know, how do you know when movements are going to succeed? And so maybe I'll highlight in the time that I have four key attributes uh, of successful uh, nonviolent resistance campaigns that I think are particularly relevant to our conversation today. Um, the first uh, key attribute is having large diverse participation. And you know, we've heard from the speakers today that what is extraordinary about the uprising today in Iran is the mass participation from every part of society. It is led by women involving school age children, workers, oil workers, professionals, people from across different economic classes, uh, dozens of cities, towns, villages across Iran and internationally. So when you have large numbers of people from many different parts of society engaged in open defiance, resistance, non-cooperation, it is extremely difficult for a regime to repress it. Because, um, you know, think about it. If, uh, you know, if you have like 4 million women in Iran who refuse to wear hijab or, or who are engaged in other acts of defiance, you can't put a fourth of the population of women in jail. It's, it's, it's impossible to suppress a movement that involves active defiance from every part of society. So you know that a movement is succeeding when large numbers of people from all different parts of the country, walks of life, unusual suspects, so people who don't normally participate in protests and resistance, are involved in the campaign. And you're right, um, Tina, Erica Chenoweth and Zoe Marks have been doing really interesting research and writing about the active participation of women in nonviolent campaigns. And they have found that uh, women's active participation strongly correlates with the success of nonviolent campaigns. And so that is definitely um, something to watch in, in Iran. And this was an attribute of the 79 revolution, although it did not lead to a democratic outcome, you had oil workers, airline officials, professionals, doctors, bazaaris, merchants, everyone engaged in acts of mass non-cooperation, protest, boycott, strikes. 
And that is another attribute of successful campaigns. When you see a large number of different nonviolent actions being used. So street protests and demonstrations are one tactic out of hundreds, if not thousands. And where really the power of nonviolent resistance comes from is mass organized non-cooperation. So in non-cooperation, so meaning stay aways, walkouts, boycotts, strikes, go slow tactics. So basically tactics that are spread out, don't involve uh, large concentrations of people are very difficult to repress A and B, they tend to be the most economically powerful um, tactics available. So expanding the repertoire of nonviolent sanctions is incredibly important. Another key attribute of successful campaigns is when you see defections taking place in key pillars of support. So pillars of support are the organizations and institutions that prop up any authoritarian regime. So it can be religious institutions, security forces, police, educational institutions, media, professional groups. So when you see people within these pillars who stop obeying orders, and it may not be completely defecting, like you know, joining the side of the opposition, but when, we, when they stop obeying orders, uh, to harm protesters, shoot at protesters, or to speak out in favor of the regime, you know that um, you know the the pro democracy movement is gaining um, you know gaining a lot of support and power. So you know there's a lot of focus on the security apparatus, and certainly it is an incredibly repressive apparatus um, in Iran. But I think what's been most interesting is the extent to which all different parts of the economy and society are engaged and actively involved in the protests. And I've been noting the role of the oil workers, for example, and looking to see if that is spreading in other areas. And Masi probably you know, would be able to share a lot more about that. So the fourth and final kind of attribute that I'll mention is that successful civil resistance campaigns are able to remain resilient in the face of repression. And, you know, Iranians are facing probably the worst form of repression with, you know, assassination, snipers, besiege, uh, mass arrests. So the worst form. And, you know, what we've seen in other successful campaigns, whether, you know, Polish Solidarity Movement, Hong Kong in Sudan, is when movements are able to organize and like build solidarity networks. So it's actually the, organi the organizing infrastructure that is the most important variable related to success. Outside support is very important and can be important, but it's actually the organizing infrastructure. So the ability to take care of people who are fired or who are imprisoned, who don't have food, that support structure is going to be key, I think, to, for the ability of this pro-democracy movement to sustain itself in what is likely to be a continuation of terrible um, violence and repression. So um, I think just um, you know, thinking about those attributes in the context of what is happening um, in Iran will help to, to show the direction that, that the movement is going in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, uh, for this insight. And, uh, and it actually yeah, opens up a whole lot of other questions that uh, we could have for you or for, uh, for Massey, uh, especially if we want to observe what's going on right now and, and whether those four attributes are things that we, uh, we have already. Uh, probably not all of them at the, the scale that uh, we would hope for. So now I'm going to uh, open the floor for questions from students here. Um, if you could, you, you have two microphones on the sides, so if you can line up uh, and, uh, and I'll, I'll give uh, the floor to, uh, you, you see the microphones right there on the sides, so you don't hesitate, you stand up. Um, and maybe until some of you have their questions ready, um, I'll ask a question to, uh, to Massy uh, about maybe this fourth, uh, you know, factor uh, that uh, Maria was referring to. Uh, to what extent do you think that we have now this, um, this power of this organizing structure that uh, Maria was referring to in Iran? Messi, over to you. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, thank you so much. First of all, I have to say that um, 
the I mean, it, I actually wrote a letter to President Biden, which can apply to all the democratic countries, uh, that there are some uh, like uh, actions that can be taken right now, but it's missing. I want to actually refer to a peti petition which is going on around among Iranians. There are two petitions, one saying that we call on all democratic countries to kick out all the diplomats from their countries and uh, close the embassies. It got more than half a million signatures. And I think that if we really believe in democracy, if we are pro-democracy, then we have to stand with Iranians uh, who are being united right now and asking democratic countries to take actions. And uh, that happened when the assassination like uh, when Iranian regime actually assassinated activists in Germany in Mykonos restaurant, uh, the German government recalled their ambassadors, they closed their embassy and kicked out the diplomats. It had a huge impact. This is the time that Iranians are asking you to, to support them and sign this petition and ask your government to, to take action. Another petition is that human rights organizations, they got united and they're asking the uh, United Nation uh, to uh, create a like accountability mechanism to make sure that this is not going to happen again, that women and men are getting killed for demanding their basic rights. But the thing is, look, right now that I'm talking to you, Iranian regime has a seat on top women's right, uh, women's council body in, 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 at the United Nation. They are there to monitor women's rights globally at the United Nations. This is a joke. I mean, when I talk about this, people might label me and say that this is, this is very radical. This is not radical, uh, saying that United Nations be, became a place to united the dictators. Maduro has a seat to monitor um, the situation of immigrants globally. Putin, I mean, just a few months ago, he had a seat at the United Nations to monitor human rights globally. Now Islamic Republic, Saudi Arabia. And that actually shows us that this is the time that we must be united and represent the civil disobedience, represent the human rights activists, represent the ordinary people in, our own, in, in Iran, in Venezuela, everywhere, everywhere. In any dictatorship, there are ordinary people taking risks putting themselves in danger and, and asking the Western countries to take, uh, you know, strong actions rather than just showing their solidarity. I had actually, I said something on French uh, TV, which went viral. I want to make it clear that I didn't mean don't show your solidarity. But I said to the female politicians that you have power. Instead of just cutting your hair, cut your ties with the Islamic Republic. That would actually send a significant signal and message to the Islamic Republic that the world, the democratic uh, countries, they are supporting Iranian revolution, Iranian movement. Thank you, thank you so much, Masi. So we have now uh, several students who are uh, ready for questions. So I would ask you if you can keep your questions uh, concise um, and, uh, and, same thing, and, and also indicate who you are asking this question to uh, so we can be efficient. So let's start with you, please. And, and speak, evening. yeah. <coughs> Good evening, can you guys hear me? Can you, can you speak louder and introduce? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot the name, <laughs> for starters. Yes, my Masi. question is. Masi Ali Neja. Masi, yes. Good evening, thank you very much for being here. So you mentioned something very important that the hijab is not just a piece of cloth, and I completely agree with you. But I disagree that you know, there is like the white obsession with freeing women with hijab does not kind of exist because they are really obsessed with freeing women from this piece of cloth. But the, the, the problem is that it's not actually the problem. The problem is that we have a lot of oppression going on and it's not just about Islam and the hijab. I don't know if that makes sense. But the thing is that I am an ex-hijabi and the fact that you ask a, a woman to take off their hijab it's not as easy as just doing what France does. When they ask this woman to take off their hijab, they will not take it off immediately. You have a lot of cultural uh, uh, pressures, you have religious pressures, and you have family pressure. So it's not as easy as doing that. And freeing these Muslim women around the world is not just about taking off their hijab. 
So I agree that I think the solution is coming together and showing solidarity and support, but at the same time, not making these women feel that the oppression means what they are wearing. Our problem is not about the hijab. The problem is asking a woman to do what she doesn't want to. So in France, asking women to wear the bikini is exactly, to me, is exactly as asking them to wear the hijab. It's just taking away women's agency, just thinking that women do not have agencies to make their own decisions. So yeah, I would like just to, to hear what you think about what I just said. Thank you. I remember that when I left Iran, I had my version of hijab. As you see, I have big hair, but I used to wear a black hat to cover my hijab, my, my hair. And answering this question that why you cover your hair from me was like, it's my choice. So it took me three years to remove my black hat. And that's the same, my sister. I grew up in a traditional family, Muslim country, the law, educational system. And my religion was telling me that if I don't cover my hair, then I go to hell and I will be hanged by my hair in the hell. So I had only one option to wear it. I mean, between hell and wear your headscarf, what do you choose? That was me. So it took me three years. So I, that is why I launched the campaign against compulsion. It's clear, it's about compulsion. And my problem is not a small piece of cloth. I strongly believe that compulsory hijab is the main visible symbol of oppression. You remember when women got free from uh, ISIS, one of the picture went viral. That was a picture of women burning their burger, you know? Now you remember the first image of women of Afghanistan, when Afghanistan was to, uh, take over by Taliban, women were wearing the burger. So hijab, when it's in the hand of religious dictatorship, it can be a tool to hang us, to kill us, to torture us. It's the main pillar, a gender apartheid regime. But for the Islamic Republic, as I always say, compulsory hijab is like the Berlin Wall. It is exactly like the Berlin Wall. When the Berlin Wall fall, communism was gone. Now, if we get successful to bring compulsory hijab wall down, the Islamic Republic won't exist. And that is why the Supreme Leader of Iran actually got very furious, recently referred to me uh, that, you know, actually, so he had, he doesn't name me, he called me an American agent. He doesn't even know that this is not me, millions of Iranians who have agency, and I was just echoing their voices. He said that this American agent compared hijab to Berlin Wall, and this is dangerous, we have to take action against it. That means they know it very well that compulsory hijab is the Achilles heel of the uh, religious dictatorship. Yes, as you mentioned, my sister, our problem is not hijab, our problem is our dignity. It's in the West, people say, my body, my choice. And everyone go to the streets. Everyone join the protest and support each other. But suddenly, when we, the women of Iran and Afghanistan say that, my body, my choice, those same Western feminists go to my country and say that, oh, now my body can be the choice of the Islamic Republic as well. All those feminists inside Iran, none of them so far, none of those Western female politicians dare to say to the Taliban, to the Islamic Republic, no, our body is our choice. That is the problem here, the double standard. I don't wanna be, because the solidarity is happening, I don't wanna be too harsh, but it just breaks my heart. It didn't need for Mahsa Amini to get killed. It didn't need for Nicole and many other teenagers to get killed, that solidarity just finally show the, its, its face, you know what I mean? So this is clear message. We are fighting for our dignity. There is Taliban, ISIS, Islamic Republic, they're using hijab as the pillar of oppressing us. And that's why we have to get together and say that don't keep us silent, just stick together. And when you say my body, my choice, 
Dan Shui. I want to actually tell you something. When President Macron was shaking the hand of uh, Butcher Ibrahim Raisi, I was crying in my safe house. I was like, why President Macron, why he never want to shake the hand of Iranian women? Why? Is that too much to ask? Because you are actually trying to get a nuclear deal, but Iranian are dealing with these butchers and murderers. So you're empowering them when you shake their hands and, it, and, and ignoring the, the women, the civil disobedience within the society. If we're really looking for stability in the region, we cannot just go and negotiate with one of the most unstable regime. We have to recognize this women's rights revolution and the civil, uh, civil society. That's my point. It's all about freedom, dignity, not about a small piece of cloth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, time really flies. So please, we have a, a lot of people lining up. So be really concise and precise in your question. Please, yeah, your team. Yes. It does? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so a question for uh, Ms. Salinejad or anybody who wants to answer that. Uh, do you think there's uh, any chance that the army, so of course the regular army, joins the movement and starts to uh, put an opposition against uh, the regime? Do you think there's a chance because it's full of patriots? So what's your idea about that? I mean, so far we haven't seen any sign, but that's the dream of millions of Iranians. Unarmed people are getting killed by revolutionary guards, by, you know, and that's why actually we ask the democratic countries like Canadian government, like French government, like uh, the EU, put the revolutionary guards on the uh, terrorist list, uh, terrorist organizations, and that could send a signal to the body of revolutionary guards to understand that their future, the futures of their children is in danger if they don't take side. That's our dream. and. Let's be realistic because no, so far, didn't happen. Thank you. Please, you have another um, question. Yes. Yeah, it works. Sorry. Um, so my question is basically: um, in many other grassroots movements, we have seen the importance of having one leader, one figure of yes, yeah, standing basically at the front of the movement which, if I'm not mistaken, we don't see yet in Iran. So I'm, my question is, like, how long do you think can this movement endure? And, like, what is the necessity of having such, such one figurehead? Or is there maybe even one already that we just don't know yet of? Thank you. Thank you. Iranians are actually in the street facing guns and bullets because they are challenging to have one leader, like supreme leader, on the top. Now they became the leaders of the movement within the society. But believe me, the, leader, the leadership will emerge in future. Now there is a huge sense of unity among oppositions inside and outside Iran. And um, all we want um, is just now saying no to dictatorship. But we want free election, fair election. And this is what we are fighting for. And I strongly believe that this is going to happen. This is going to happen when we get united now and support the local like leaders among uh, the, the, the people who are in the streets. If we support them, then in the future, Iranian people are going to make decision uh, for who to run the country. But believe me, if you open the doors of prison, having prison, just full of uh, intellectual, smart and educated leaders, they can run the country better than these backward mullahs. There are many intellectuals and educated oppositions outside Iran, inside Iran. They can run the country better than Raisi, better than Khamenei themselves. Thank you. And Maria, you, you wanted to uh, add something to, uh, to those questions. Yeah, and, and it actually relates to the third question as well. I mean, I think in terms of the movement's ability to sustain itself, um, you know, again, if you start to see more groups, more people participating from different parts of society, and if you see the development of infrastructure, because I think this is what's really key. Will a movement be able to sustain itself in the face of repression? Well, again, during 70, 79, 
even though it was a non-democratic outcome, you had the merchant class, you had clerics, you had students who were forming underground institutions. So you had parallel structures and, econ and institutions, economic, social, political, providing mutual aid, providing food, providing medical assistance. This is the type of infrastructure and support that allows a movement to withstand significant amount of repression. So that's like looking for that and that's something outside folks can maybe find ways to support through various means helping with solidarity funds you know support for mutual aid is critically important and i would just say when it comes to defections security forces are really key and it's true when soldiers paramilitaries refuse orders to shoot at peaceful protesters and they defect um, it can be incredibly powerful it can be the end of a regime Security forces are not the only important pillar of support holding up authoritarianism. So, and often they are the last to go. So just focusing on security forces when there are other economic pillars, when there are media pillars, when there are clerics who are maybe not so happy with the regime, when there are educational institutions. So there are lots of other institutions where if you see loyalty shifts, if you see defections, that is going to significantly weaken the regime's grip on power. So security forces are important. They're not the only thing. When it comes to tactics, removing the hijab can be a powerful act of defiance for all the reasons um, that Masih uh, explained. It is not the only tactic, and it's not the only tactic that everyone is going to be using inside Iran. So again, looking for other tactics that people are using, including more dispersed acts that are harder to repress, the stay aways, walking slowly, doing things that you're not supposed to be doing in quiet ways, civil servants who maybe aren't doing such a great job in the office. They're going slow. They're making mistakes. There are hundreds of ways for people to show defiance and to engage in non-cooperation in ways that may be less risky, but, but important because it brings more people into the fight. Thank you, Maria. Please, another question from here. I don't answer. hear the question. Yeah. Sorry, do you hear me now? No, yes. Um, you touched upon this in your answer to your first question um, when you said that um, European countries should cut all ties uh, with the Islamic regime of Iran. Uh, but I was wondering, what is your opinion on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, when European countries are also trying to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon? Um, do you have any opinion on it? Please, thank you. That's a very, very good question. Look, um, I met with Jake Sullivan and Secretary Blinken, and I told them the same thing, that you have to stop negotiating with the Islamic Republic until they stop killing their own people. From the beginning, they both were saying that we have to stick with our own policy because we want to stop Iran from having a nuclear bomb. That's very clear. We are fighting against the same thing. But I believe that having a democratic Iran will help the world to be a much safer place to live. I'm not asking the US government to bring democracy or, or regime change, but while Iranian people themselves are managing to shake the regime, then this is the time that they have to stop sending billions of dollars to the same regime. And uh, some of the people might say that by sanctioning, maybe they hurt uh, ordinary people. I mean, I'm coming from poor family. I'm being in touch with millions of people. The money which goes through a nuclear deal, uh, it doesn't go to, to ordinary people. I want to just give you three examples. First, when we were suffering from sanction, Javad Zarif, the foreign minister, announced that publicly that we are proudly sending the money to Iraq. Then uh, Hassan Rouhani announced that proudly we send the money to Bashar Assad. Third, publicly they announced that we build up a, a, a hospital in Venezuela while Iranian people were suffering from sanction. So clearly the money goes to the proxies or those countries that supporting Iran and helping them to oppress people to suppress any uprising and ongoing protest in Iran. So for that, I think the dictators are more united from Russia to China, Venezuela, Right now that I'm talking to you, President Zelensky announced that um, 
the Islamic Republic provided drones, many drones, to attack people in Ukraine. So clearly, Ukrainian people are getting killed by Islamic Republic drones. So you see, this is the time. Now, US citizen, British citizen, um, German citizen, French citizen, Belgium citizens, many citizens from Western countries, democratic countries are in prison. They're being used like bargaining chip. Clearly, they took hostage to use them to get a nuclear deal. So imagine the democratic countries get united the way that the dictators are united and ask the Iranian regime that we downgrade our diplomatic relation until you release all the innocent political prisoners. We shut down the embassies. We kicked out all the diplomats until the day that you respect human rights values. That's my message. I mean, of course, we all want to have Iran without nuclear bomb. But this is not the way that burying human rights on their nuclear deal, that's not going to help because Islamic Republic showed that they are not an uh, honest broker. They cheat. Clearly, they cheat. So the only language that the Islamic Republic understand is the language of pressure. Democratic countries, will, they must stick with democratic values and then negotiate with the regime. Otherwise, they are empowering uh, the, the same regime that at the same time, they are condemning their oppressive uh, method and killing and murderings. That's my point. Stop giving millions, billions of dollars to the Revolutionary Guards, to the regime, which is going to use this um, to increase the budget of religious institution, to increase the budget of uh, revolutionary guards to kill people inside Iran. Now we, the people of Ukraine and the people of Iran, we understand the war. We understand the war. And that is why we're calling the democratic countries. The way that President Zelensky bravely asked all the European countries to isolate Putin, now the democratic countries must address Khamenei the same way that they addressed uh, Putin. Thank you. Uh, we're really close to the end of the event and we have three more questions here. So, right? <laughs> so what I suggest is we are going to ask the three of you to tell your questions very briefly uh, back to back and so we can have uh, them all addressed hopefully. But be, please be concise, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Thank this you. question is to Messi. First of all, Messi, many of us are following you on, online, and I just want to say thank you for your tireless effort. Uh, we see you tired, exhausted, uh, and you keep fighting. I want to say thank you for that. My question is, uh, because I myself have Kurdish-Iranian background, uh, and I, my out view basically is, uh, is Kurdish. That's the media I follow, that's the language I know best. And unfortunately, one of my experiences is that often when we try to express some of our visions for a new Iran, the separatist card is, uh, is thrown on the table. And I don't think it's fair because uh, all that we are saying, many of us, is within the framework of, uh, first of all, within the territory of Iran, within the framework of human rights. Uh, and I know you've been talking to Bahman Khubadi, you have shared Kurdish language stuff on your Twitter, it, it really touched my heart, I, I feel seen, and I know that many Kurds feel seen, so thank you for that. But I want to ask you, what is your vision of this separatist question and do you have based on your experience with iranians and kurds whatever background they may have uh, for the future is it um, does it have any uh, truth to it or not thank you okay we we take the second question please hi uh first of all uh thank you Monsieur and thank you also the Sciences Po administration for organizing this event um, as we speak, uh, Faribad al Khah, which is a Sion Spu uh, member, is still imprisoned in Iran, and uh, it's uh, surprising to know that she wasn't a harsh dissident at all against the regime uh, before being imprisoned. Um, as a Franco Iranian, um, I know that the situation in Iran and in France has nothing to do with another, be it for women's rights or be it in the, for the religious um, questions. Um, and the, this situation di difference is voluntarily ignored by the Iranian regime, its lobbyists in the West, and uh, unexperimented journalists. Um, exactly like Putin was returning the question of protesters in Russia uh, against um, the Gilets Jaunes in France three years ago. Um, so my question would be, how can we address and how could we, we be careful in France with the lobbyists 
that are presented as journalists, experts, commentators, and so on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And the final question? It's wonderful as always to hear you speak and to hear your opinions on what's going on in Iran. My question is about what ordinary people can do to show solidarity and to help the people in Iran right now. Not all of us, unfortunately, have uh, the political sway to make the changes we may like to, but I'm wondering how we can help. Thank you. Merci, John. Can I start from the last question? Yes, of course. <laughs> Look, um, what is going on in Iran, it's coming from ordinary people. So that actually shows you the power of ordinary people. Never think that you have to be a journalist, activist, believe me, for years and years, ordinary people were actually the, in the in front line fighting the regime. The mothers, the mothers whose children got killed. You remember the time when Iranian regime said any people who send videos to Masi Alinejad will be charged up to 10 years prison? Many of my colleagues, journalists, activists, even my family members, they got scared because they didn't want to go to prison for 10 years. Ordinary people filming themselves, the mothers of those who got killed, taking the picture of their beloved one, Nahid Shirpiche, Puyo's mother. They took to the street at the same time saying that this is the street that the regime killed my son. I'm filming myself. Masi, be my voice. These are ordinary people. They can bring change within the society. Ordinary people outside Iran can help them echo their voice, be their voice, try to, I'm gonna get back to the second question, try to uh, beat the, the wrong narrative, which the Islamic Republic lobbyists and apologists, unfortunately being welcome to media, to mainstream media, to sell the wrong narrative, you can actually challenge them. I believe that social media is like our weapon. You know, the Iranian regime, they have guns and bullets, but social media, can help you to break the censorship, to send your message to the leaders of the free world. Nowadays, they, can, they cannot ignore social, the power of social media. You know, I'm not a model, I'm not an actress. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, echoing the voice of Iranians. I have more than 10, 10 million uh, followers on my social media, why? Because ordinary people sending videos and the rest of the world are in awe. They're amazed at how these women walking unveiled, which is a punishable crime, how these mothers saying that we will bring this regime down, we became like a nightmares of the regime. That actually can change the atmosphere in the mainstream media as well. About Kurdish people, Zur Sipas, I have to say that if Gina Mahsa was not a Kurdish girl, believe me, maybe people don't like to hear that, but we would not be able to see such a solidarity. Before Mahsa Amini, Sahar Khodayari, a blue girl, a girl whose dream was just to watch football, a girl who dressed up like a boy to enter to a stadium, got killed. She was arrested just because of entering a stadium. And then they did everything to her. She didn't have any other option to set herself on fire and kill herself. When Sahar got killed, my dream was to see that all people around like the country, like stop going to stadium, getting united, showing their solidarity and saying that we are all Sahar. That didn't happen. But immediately when Gina, Kurdish name of Mahsa Amini, when she got killed, the Kurdish people took to the street. Instead of crying, they created the, the, the the, the new movement by saying that Zhen Jian Azadi means woman, life, freedom. Kurdish people take to the street by waving their headscarves. That actually, for years and years, that changed the narrative. For years and years, that, that was Iranian regime labeling them. You know about that. But they showed to the rest of the world that we are one country. And they actually, um, show the rest of the world that we should get united because we have one common enemy. I see that sometimes New York Times uh, putting the uh, headline about separatism, labeling the protesters, but we all know that. 
from Kurdistan to Tehran, to Zahedan, to Mashhad, north, south, people are united. And there one Iran trying to say that we are, we are being hanged, we are being killed, tortured, oppressed, censored. But now we are all Mahsa, we are all Jina, and we're not gonna let Iranian regime to label us and separate us from each other. That's why we are winning. That's why they were scared of our unity. Not only the unity among Iranians, minorities, Iranians uh, with different opinions, the unity that we see across the globe is going to uh, shake the regime. That is why I say that this is just the beginning of the end. Thank you so much, everyone, for inviting me. And I hope one day I invite you all to my country, my beautiful homeland, Iran, without forcing you to cover yourself. Thank you. That's my dream. I haven't seen my mother for 13 years. Now all of us have this dream that we're gonna go back and hug not just our mother, hug Iran, hug freedom. Thank you. Masi, thanks everyone. I've got a dash to another meeting, but great speaking with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you so much, Masi John. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you. It's been a, a sincere pleasure, and uh, and I know from uh, the audience you can't see uh, here that uh, uh, we've yeah. been really grateful for uh, for these uh, insights that you shared with us. The conversation on those unprecedented events is going to continue. I'm sure about that, and. Uh, and I would like to thank also everybody who has been, uh, who have been watching us uh, remotely. Thank you very much, Dean Gonzalez, uh, and uh, and yeah. Thank you, Take thank care. you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. The solidarity vote to Sarah.